All right, welcome to the Indie Artist Podcast. This is our very, very first podcast. We have Sean French over here and Niall Popcheck over here. What's up? And I forget this guy's name here. Me too. I don't. <laughs> Michael Jan Antonio. Give and, me a beer or two, I'll remember. <laughs> and I am John Voigt. Welcome to our very first podcast. We're going to start out this podcast by everybody introducing themselves and who they are and what they do here. I'll start with myself, and then I'll, I'll introduce you guys around the room. I am John Voigt. I'm the vice president here at Summit Star Studios, and that's about it. <laughs> All right. Wow, man. That was a that hell was of an fair. intro. Yeah. Well, you know, I like to keep it simple. I'm not, I, like I don't like loose. to brag about myself too much. <laughs> I mean, you got to do a little something it's here. Rock star Tell land. me a little bit sure. about John Voigt. You know, I, I produce films. I just go with the flow. Go with the flow. <laughs> All right. Niall, how about you? I am the chief audio engineer at Summitstar. This is a new space. We finished... We're almost finished with construction, but we're finished with the main area where Mike and I work. Um, we finished that in October, so we've been pretty much going full bore since then. I've been doing two series. I'm almost done with one. Got a film coming in and another documentary I'm working on currently as well. Let's go over here to Sean. Sean, what, what do you do? Sean T. Finch. Fine artist. Uh, I like to think of myself as a uh, extreme artist. Mostly, I'm a metal sculptor. Um, I have shows in galleries, shows in uh, at events. Uh, do things like Burning Man, um, movies, uh, all kinds of different things to get the art out there. Uh, now I have uh, larger shows. Uh, the last one had maybe 300 people at it. We were in uh, Painted Tiger Studios here in Phoenix, which uh, is a city block size space. Um, and set that all up with a traditional gallery space that had pieces like the one behind you guys there that, uh, you know, was set up with the proper lighting on pedestals and all that sort of thing. Recently, you know, I just w was honored by Summit Star to uh, have them host that event at Painted Tiger Studios. So again, we had film studios being involved with fine art in order to get these images out there and get these messages out there and i think that there's an excitement to that that i want to talk about yeah that's one of definitely one of the goals here of our, our our new podcast here is to actually you know get the community all involved and and other artists to come in and you know kind of discuss all what they do and how to get involved and get their contact information and be one happy community all right how about you michael michael g the g spot baby oh, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> President and CEO of Summit Star Films and Summit Star Studios. Filmmaker extraordinaire, hopefully. So been making films for a hot minute. Made a lot of films with Johnny here. He's a little modest about what we've done, but uh, I kind of like that. His career goes back about as long as his hair. So, uh, <laughs> we started making movies in uh, 2003. Oh, wow. Yep. So it's been um, 20 years. Almost 20 years, yeah. Uh, wow. 20 years. Wow. Uh, we have two films in post, and then we have uh, numerous films in development as well. Uh, I'm a former musician, uh, as is uh, Sean, and you'd swear that John is, although he's not. <laughs> Niall used to beat on some skins every once yeah, in a while. Yeah, so played drums for years, yeah. So I used to do uh, magic and hypnosis shows, toured worldwide. I've, I don't know, performed thousands and thousands of shows. Couldn't even tell you how many. He uh, never uses it on us either. No, <laughs> just, you will do what I say. Yeah. <laughs> he's like... <laughs> Uh, now I'm a filmmaker full time. I uh, I contract occasionally as a producer director and sometimes director of photography. And my real passion is making our own in house projects happen, and that's what we do. We uh, came up with the idea for the Indie Artist Podcast a little while ago, and decided uh, let's just throw it down. So here we are. I'm uh, I'm ready. Let's do this thing. And the concept for this whole place is your fault too, right? I mean, no, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I mean, this yeah. uh, this spot is like, I mean, you get it. <laughs> you yeah, it's, it's, this is it's, amazing uh, space. The space is fun and and uh, was a two year project to build, um, which we could probably get into here in a in a piece. The space is here, and like we're in the right place for it. Uh, these artists that you're talking about. I'm meeting every day. I'm running into amazing stuff, amazing stories, amazing things they're building, uh, you know, stuff that's being combined uh, in ways that I haven't seen before. So, yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. It's going to be fun. Yeah. So uh, where do we start? Let's start here with Sean. Talk about some of your favorite pieces that you've made. 
I do love a lot of my pieces myself. I've really put a lot into them. Uh, they all have stories, they all have characters, and I have to admit, I even sometimes talk to them. It's a little bit of a history that they get, you know, that, that gives them sort of my endearment to them, but also, like, their character. I'll always love a piece that I've made called Descent, which is this sort of reclining female space that looks like it's shooting through the atmosphere. It's actually meant to represent sort of this female strength coming back into power. It also speaks to the metaphor that we all wear our own armor, that we build armor through life to just present ourselves anywhere. That's why these pieces look armored, not, not as if they were going into battle. It's about the armor that we all put on in life. And so you'll see that metaphor in many of my pieces. I'm also very fond of the fire shooting pieces. I have one called Don't Touch, and then uh, the, the giant phoenix is just so much fun. I have 30 or so in my current in inventory and you know to be honest with you i don't know that i could really say anyone's my favorite kind of you know? like your own babies yeah yeah um there's a few of them you know like like for instance the phoenix that i, I just took down from painted Ti tiger studio has been to burning man you know and so what that meant is that this 20 foot long piece had to get into my sprinter van and drive across the country to get up there you know with me in it that was an adventure that made me endeared to it. It's it like we, you know, spent several nights, you know, there in the van cruising up there and doing this thing. And then when we got there, we set it up in this, you know, very tough environment. Uh, I dealt with 70 mile per hour dusty winds and, you know, yeah, stood through the whole thing. <laughs> so that's where the extreme <laughs> art comes in. You know, I'll find myself, you know, going through a physical battle literally to get something up and standing and then still have to go and make the fire systems work. It's just really rewarding to see that, you know, piece set up somewhere, you know, doing its thing. A lot of them have been through a lot. One of them was oversprayed with paint. One of them was hit by a car. A lot of different things have happened to them, you know, but, you know, I, I bring them back together and, you know. Are you like Michael where you, you start a project or you look at something and go, 20 years later, you know, I need to add some more to it. I, I, a little bit. I, I, need to, I, could, I could do that again and then totally change it, done. and it's never right. done. Yeah. Uh, you know, what? what's never done is the entire series. The pieces, strangely enough, I actually see almost complete before I start them. And I don't stop until they get to that point. But I really do take the pieces to a completion that's really important to me. It's part of the process, and I think I got that from the armoring. You know, when you're doing historically correct armoring, there wasn't a shortcut. You know, it had to be done. It had to work. Not only did it have to feel nice, you had to be able to fight in it, move around, run, all kinds of different things that made it really have to be finished correctly. And so I pulled that forward into the way I do my sculpting. And I think that one of the things about this series that's been successful is being able to identify from beginning to end what I want to make and then actually completing it and then saying, okay, this is the statement this piece makes very clearly. That's a big difference from the other artworks that I've done in the past. I had paintings that would sit on an easel for, for literally years and years, and I would stare at them and go, is it done? What does it mean? I don't know, you know, these, not at all. These, I, I can tell you exactly what they mean, exactly what their expression is, exactly what they're trying to do. And I feel like I've got this, it's kind of this, I call it my passion possession. You know, most of the time it's a wonderful passion, but sometimes I just feel possessed. You know, like I just have to really do this. And my personal life has driven a lot of things around it too. I uh, walked backwards off scaffolding uh, in the early 90s doing the murals and broke my back. Didn't have good insurance because artists don't have good insurance. And none of it he healed right. And so uh, I actually got to a point where I thought I wasn't going to be able to work or certainly not do anything like pound metal until I just switched that completely around and said, no, the thing I need to do is pound metal. I've got different pieces, one of them called The Ghost Within, which is actually depicting a ghost, the ghost of my first wife coming out of my back where it was broken, handing me my hammer, which is a cast of the hammer that I've hit every piece with, with the message that... She made clear to me in not so friendly terms that if I wasn't working, I was essentially going to be haunted and cursed by her for the rest of my life, which I kind of started to experience when I wouldn't work. I'm almost scared to stop. 
<laughs> and so, like, you know, I, I find myself, okay, I'm going to have two days. It's, you know, some holiday or something. I get to watch TV. I, I don't make it through the first half of the day when I start feeling achy, uncomfortable, and start thinking, wow, is that the thing? Because I've let myself think that. And then I find myself in the shop working on something and, you know, loving it. And time goes by, and all of a sudden, wow, you know, I got to force myself to go to bed. It is this passion possession that, you know, I do go to sleep thinking of pieces I want to make and wake up thinking, oh, they, I get to go make that piece. It's a blessing combined with a sort of curse in a way. So what's a typical work day then for you like? I get up at a relatively normal time, uh, spend, you know, usually it's not less than 10 hours, usually 10 to 12 hours in the shop. It's um, a combination of cutting, shaping, and then a lot of hammering. I do almost all of my work with my arms. Uh, I use a lot of tools that I make because I like the way it feels like when I feel the metal, you know, shape underneath my hammer. I have to kind of balance that out. I can't just hammer on stuff 10, 12 hours a day and expect to have limbs that are going to work. I switch it out. You know, sometimes I'm doing cutting. Sometimes I'm, you know, designing something or I'm working on a finish or polishing or something like that as well as hammering. These are tasks that a lot of people find tough to do for long periods of time that for some reason... I attach to and I find peace in. I work in a relatively, you know, modest space. It's essentially a three-car garage that's been converted into my metal shop. It's funny, that's actually where uh, History Channel filmed a, a show that I was in, um, in this small little room. It's enough for me. It works really well. There's no windows. You know, it's got, you know, AC in part of it, but for the most part, it, it's hot like Phoenix in the summer. And I like that. Uh, I have a foundry in the back and a forge. You know, those are often 2,000 degrees. The temperature outside is often 115. I actually like all that. I feel less pain in my joints in that kind of temperature. It's why we're in Phoenix. And again, you know, puts me into me what I consider to be an extreme art category, working at these high temperatures, working with stuff that is potentially dangerous, you know, propane gases, all this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's not your average you know, sit down with, you know, a paint canvas and paintbrush kind of work. Okay, now let's talk about you for a little bit. Oh, yeah, thank you, John. You bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. What kind of stuff do you do? And then, Well, it's interesting because it's kind of, I, I like the idea of like this kind of passion possession thing because I think that happens with what I do as well because even especially with, with like music or something, you can have like this burst of creativity one night and like, just go crazy and maybe you make almost a complete song in one night but it's important for me with artists to like be able to move fairly quickly because like that wave that you catch that creative wave can like end at any time so like you don't want to hold it up or you don't want to like slow it down so you have to really move quickly it's part of the reason why i'm pretty fast on pro tools but also i just try to keep the artist involved the whole time when I work, I like full collaboration and I like them to just be able to get what they're looking for quickly. And I think that the toughest thing about working with artists initially, like if it's a new artist, is like just understanding their language and how to translate that into into what you're doing. Because everyone kind of speaks differently about how they want something to sound and the words that they use, you kind of have to decipher what they're looking for. So usually I have to kind of build a relationship with an artist and allow them to be able to feel vulnerable where they feel like they can try something that might not work or, you know, even sound bad for a moment, you know, or whatever, just to be able to try uh, creative stuff. What's cool about this space is it's important to create a really good environment for that, like a creative space. Anybody that's come upstairs with us has really felt like they could create in that space i don't know if it's just because so much went into it you know like mike's heart went into it and like there's a lot of love behind like the the space that we created and i feel like artists can feel that instantly instantly Boom. um so it's like creating a great space for just an open canvas or whatever to kind of make that creative flow state happen quickly um, starts with the environment. So what's what's so different about that space? I mean, you've been in some studios, right? Like, what did we do? Here, everything's very clean. Like, and that was all Mike, because he's a 
Um, used to be an electrician, but just like the way things are wired, it just feels like in a lot of studios I've been, it's just like a rat's nest of wires and stuff. It's almost like if you have a room and it's dirty, like you feel like you can't do anything until it's clean. And that's kind of great here because it, it feels clean immediately. So it just feels like you have a fresh slate. And also we just set it up in a way that like, as we progress with technology and stuff that we're going to do, it's going to be very easily implemented. I mean, honestly, the booth that was created is, I've been to a lot of studios. It's, it's the best booth I've ever heard. And that took a lot of trial and error. And it took a lot of planning, having your tools laid out for you before you even start without it being just disorganized and messy is like huge for creation. So that's kind of some of the big differences. I think it's also just so customized to what we want to do. Like Mike, you know, helped, I helped with this idea of like this desk that I wanted to create. Right. And it was custom to how I work and Mike did the same thing for editing. That right there is just like a game changer. Cause it's just like, it feels like it's made for you because of that. I can work even faster and more efficient. It's just great. I mean, it's just part of like the awesomeness of the space, I guess. Not to mention like we cut we're, we're I mean, we're right next to each other on this. Yeah. I mean, what yeah. you're six feet away or yeah. 10 feet away or whatever it is. Like yeah. this was a very bold thing to do. Cause I've, I've never done this before, mm -hmm. but in my mind, I was like, you know, I really feel like if I'm working with somebody, I need to work next to them. Mm-hmm. And I need to do that in such a way where it's not disturbing to work next to somebody. The whole thing is like we have these two massive edit stations. Yeah. And they are. We're capable of doing virtually everything that you could do in a major studio. Like when I was at Capitol Records in the, in the writer's room, mm -hmm. that room had nothing on this space. Mm -hmm. When I was in the room, I was just like... You know, I, I, I enjoy this space. I'm glad I'm here. I enjoyed the experience of being in the space, but I never felt like the space did anything for me. Yeah. It was just another room. It was just another space. And the thing that made it cool was like the fact that I'm sitting here where the Beatles recorded and yeah. where, you know, yeah. all these guys did this. And at the end of the day, I would rather record upstairs. Yeah. It, it feels more intimate. Like I think it's not the biggest space in the world, but like, you know, some of those spaces can feel sterile or like just not, you know, cause some magical stuff can happen at a home studio. Right. Just because it feels more like intimate. I think this is a really good blend of that mixed with like, Oh, by the way, we can also do like whatever you want just cause it's set up that way. It seems almost akin to like my making my own tools. It's like you made your, this yeah. big tool that fits your hand, it's all right there. Everything seems very clear, you know, accessible, thought out. You know, you're not running into things to turn this or that. You can see all the way through to the vocal booth from, you know, where you guys, I mean, it's just, it's thought out well. That says a lot, you know, yeah. experience behind this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even like coming down to like just the finer details, right, where we're 45 basically took a lot of the 90 degree angles out of the room and and then the windows are slanted um, which was mike's idea so your reflection bounces to where you want it to go it's just like a lot of forethought but then at the end of the day you could be in a room and it doesn't feel right but this room feels great you know to anybody so it's kind of the magic of like planning it out for the technology but also it has to have the right feel and i think it it captures both of that really well I don't know. We were jamming in the live room. Yeah. Right. And, and the first time we jammed in a live room, I didn't even have acoustics up, you know, on, on a lot of the walls. And, and it was just this, like, I have rehearsed in a lot of places, you know, like yeah, band wise and stuff. I mean, we played in studios, we played in, you know, we had space at Francisco. We had, you know, the, the shed out back. I mean, you name it. We played in everything you could ever imagine and never have I ever played in a space that it sounded so fucking good. I remember stopping you and going, man, Dude, are you was, hearing this? It's fucking you know, like, amazing. Yeah, it, that space, we nailed the shit. Yeah. Like, if you want to talk about a space, when you go into the live room, I want to fucking eat my head. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? mean? It's, it's like, all of a sudden, I just, I feel like I've just, like, performed in an arena. It, yeah. It, it, it is <laughs> outstanding. And, and I cannot tell you it's match. You know, yeah, not and I think I know a, a lot of bands will do that, right? Where it's like, to get out of the sterile environment of a studio... Some of the best albums you've ever heard, they were just like, all right, we're going to take our engineer with us. We're going to like 
rent a mansion for a year, set up mm-hmm. where we're, and we're just going to always be around each other creating. There's a magic with that too, where it feels a little more free. I mean, your environment is key. It's really, it's crazy how much of a difference it makes. Yeah. When you had your wife in there that night, it's just, that room sounded spectacular. Yeah. And like, you know, one of the first ones to be in there and like, you know, just testing it out. It feels good when you just, it just feels like you can kind of do whatever you want, like whatever you can dream of, we can do it. I think having a space like this, that's so naturally creative feeling aids that collaboration. It aids people to feel comfortable to be like, okay, now I can do that thing I do. Mm -hmm. I'm in this comfortable place. That's important. Yeah. You got to capture like someone alone at home, like what they're going to do creatively is, you know, far different than what they're going to do when they step into like a professional studio. And you don't want an artist to stiffen up, right? You don't want them to stiffen up and feel this kind of pressure of being in like a corporate environment or whatever it is. So to be able to capture kind of like, I feel like I'm at home, but like, I know we can like get great shit. That's, you know, the blend you're looking for. How many rooms does this studio have? Nine. We have nine rooms. There's the fuck shack. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Can we say that? (laughs) We just did. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. When you first come through the the front door, you enter into a reception area that's about 85% complete, I would say right now. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're... (laughs) A couple things button up. We're getting there. (laughs) Yeah. But it's a two man band, you know. It, well, you a know, lot of time it's this a one was man band. this was a studio. I mean, when I came up with the idea to build this studio, I I allocated the funds to build the entire studio and to hire contractors, and then COVID hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, we all went through God knows what with COVID, and you know, personally and professionally and whatever yeah, it hit, our, hit our industry real hard. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's an understatement. Yeah, I never would have thought hey, I'm on track to build this like studio and to get all this stuff done and hire all these people and and nobody would show up. I couldn't get a person to come out here to build the fucking studio. Right. <laughs> and not only that, but, you know, trying to get, you know, you couldn't get the city to come out. There was nothing you could do about anything. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? Just push this massive pause button for like a year and a half while everyone tries to figure out what the hell we're going to do? Freaking yeah. glad you didn't, man. You, you, no, you, <laughs> so what did I, I just was like, no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I'm not doing it. If you're not going to, if if I can't get somebody to come out here and do this, I will do what I've always done and I'll just do the damn shit myself. Yeah. If I would have known the shit that I would go through when I said I'm going <laughs> to do this myself, I might as well just drive off the Grand Canyon and go soaring to the bottom because it was insane, the shit that I went through. Long story short, here it is. the studio's here. Yeah. And, and while we're not 100% complete in a lot of the spaces... We're getting there. Like the the space that we're sitting in right now, I would say we're probably 85%, yep. maybe complete. Yep. Niall came over and, and we were slinging drywall mud for four days. and Blowing insulation, doing mud, <laughs> doing sheetrock. But it's cool because it's like there's a part of us in the walls, you know. Yeah. We didn't just buy the space and come in here. I think, you know, you might be speaking to more of why it feels, you know, so great too, you know, as it was your your sweat equity in it, you know, and the timing may have been, you know, uninformed. It may have just been a blind faith in a way, but the timing to me, you know, from my position is fantastic. If you were a person that thought, well, COVID's going to come through and we're done. There's not going to be any more live music. There's not going to be any more live shooting. We're not going to do art shows. We're not doing anything else anymore. You gave up. And you sat during that time and you watched a bunch of old TV and you did a bunch of things. If you just had a little bit of blind faith during that time, you did something like this, or this would take a lot, but you did, you know, something like this. And now you're sitting here at this moment when, like I said earlier, this, this area has got so much going on. Uh, You know, uh, the timing is, is the opposite of COVID right now. It's, It's like, let's bring things here. Let's start new things going. Let's combine efforts. Let's make a lot happen. Now Summit Star is sitting here, right, you know, standing proud right here, ready to go. Here we are. Yeah, this studio shouldn't even exist. Mm. This was, it's not that it was an afterthought. It's that we had plans for this side of the building. Yeah, we were going to wait on that. You know, like we would have had a door from the recording studios upstairs 
that if you would have walked out of, you'd have fell 20 <laughs> feet and died. Yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, that's <laughs> ultimately what happened. Style, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I have this problem. <laughs> and John knows my problem, and I think Niall does now, too. <laughs> Everyone's, you know, if, if you're around me long enough, you learn my problem. The word half-ass does not exist in yeah, my vocabulary. Yeah, I'll give you that. It's yeah. like, I will, I will do this, be it a film, be it this place, be it anything. It doesn't matter. So I got this thing in my head that I could just build this place by myself. <laughs> I will never do this again. I you mean, day one. Day one, I got photos of this shit. I'm upstairs by myself. I'm doing some demo. And I knocked this two by six loose. And this thing's like 16 feet long, two by six. And I'm whacking this thing with a fledge hammer trying to, and it pops off and I'm like, yeah, I'm big bad. You know, I'm, it's like slow motion all of a sudden. I see this board in the air. And the next thing I know, I see it coming down a little and a little more. And it knocks me over and lands on my leg. Not a huge deal, except for the fact that there's still nails in this thing. Oh, yeah. And so I've got these three inch nails stuck in my shin. Like this board that weighs God and knows what up. is laying on my leg with these nails stuck in my shin. And like I'm whacking the board and it won't come out of my shin. And I grab this sledgehammer and I whack this board. And the next thing I know, all it is is just a blood fest. Oh yeah, yeah. And this is this is day one of this thing. When when they no say one to this, call to either, right? I mean, it was just you. Wasn't it was it? just me. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm up here. I'm going like, what? Are, I'm like sticking shit in these holes. I still have vampire holes. There's two vampire holes <laughs> in my shin the from two bigger. years ago. It's your bite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like over this whole time, if I counted the times that I've been fucked up by this place, I should be dead. Like. That's falling off it, ladders man. and you know cut myself on this and you you name it it's just like it that soul wouldn't be in it if you had crews come in and do it you know no i mean not the a, thing you, is is you know you know this thing i had an idea and i created a 3d kind of build of the place and john remembers yeah, yeah, the 3d remember build too. we walked through this place twice and then i changed the whole fucking design two days later i'm like yep. no john i'm doing it different and this isn't going to work and too fucking bad what we talked about that we need to talk about lot. some shit again <laughs> we're targeting <laughs> <you know>? it <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know and, and john looks at me like are you crazy i mean we just spent like a, a week sitting down to fit you know and and i'm going i'm sorry it's just not going to work yeah and you know at the end of the day here we go again i can't half-ass this it wasn't working for me like the way we designed it wasn't working and it it just didn't make sense. So it was, I'm going back to the drawing board. And when I went back to the drawing board again and came back with a new design, all of a sudden things started making sense. And from that day forward, it just, this place clicked. Yeah. You know, and then it became this whole, we need to do a podcast studio. And that's John. He had the vision to say, create a studio space and let's make a podcast studio and not just a podcast studio. Let's make a badass podcast studio. Cause you know what? Most people, what do they do? They take a table and they connect it to a wall. It's a laminated piece of shit. You're in an office space with a drop ceiling and some bullshit. I mean, come on, this is studio a, and I feel like I got tons of space around me right now. I mean, uh, what do I have from here to the wall? 10 feet. Yeah. I'm not cramped up in this space. You know what I feel like? I feel like I'm center stage. Mm -hmm. I'm literally sitting here. Yeah. I'm engrossed in conversation with you guys in this space that's never been used before. And I really feel like this space nails it. Yeah. And everywhere I've been in this building has nailed it. Mm -hmm. That's you a know? way, to, you know, I would almost describe the live room like that too. You almost feel when you're playing at a certain point, like you're in a bigger arena sort of yeah, thing and then right? like you're on stage i just it, yeah it's a feeling and you can't you can't describe the feeling that you have other than this is awesome you yeah, know and, and you and you want to do something i do i do and and yeah. i would have never done a podcast are you kidding me no way you're gonna put me on a podcast <laughs> right you want to put me on a stage fine i'm cool with that but why do you think i'm a director you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not in front of a camera. Other side. You know? yeah. Was, yeah, we're all used to being behind you, the scenes. I feel like when we sit at this table, I'm having a conversation with my friends. Mm -hmm. When we lateraled into the film industry, Summit Star Films took over. And, and then the next thing we knew, we're building a post house in downtown Phoenix. Oh, okay. When we put this post house together in downtown Phoenix. I mean, we, we found ourselves reaching to Hollywood. We found we were doing big deals. Film financing was happening. There was a lot of things that were going on 
other than us just running a post house. But we learned a lot about what not to do. Yeah. And so now we sit here. What not to do, then what to do. (laughs) Now we sit here knowing what to do. And there's a big difference because now I feel like we have something that we didn't have before. We have assets that reach far beyond experience. We have assets that reach far beyond this building. We have something that I feel like nobody else in Arizona has. And that makes us very dangerous right now. Well, it also combines with the climate in the industry, right? I mean, it's not just me who feels that this area is getting greater attention. Things are happening with incentive. Mm-hmm. Things are happening with attention here. I've heard of post-production and other other studios moving here from California, all kinds of, you know, there's, there's an energy that feels, again, everything has its moment. Everything comes in like these waves. You know, I, I've told many people and uh, uh, believe strongly myself that right now we're in a moment, maybe it's this, that you know, this decade uh, or so uh, in this Phoenix area. Uh, maybe it's a larger area that encompasses all the way, you know, over to New Mexico, up to Vegas and out to California. But it's kind of this corner that feels to have this attention, this kind of uh, attraction to its imagery and, and, and what's going on here that I think you couldn't really have predicted the timing on but it feels Mm -hmm. like you're capturing the moment Mm -hmm. you know and 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 being here for this is is amazing you know for someone like me seeing this as something that can grow into all the things that i've i've found in all the different corners you know all around the state and such this feels like a uh a place that it can gather that it can group that can all kind of be put into context and, and and talked about you know and i think that that's you know what we'll have fun talking about you know yeah is that kind of that kind of thing so I, I never actually answered your question. I did say we have <laughs> nine rooms, but let me break this down real fast. So the the reception area is, the, is your entrance area, and then you've got a restroom. We have a little kitchenette area. Then we have an executive office, an equipment warehouse, and that's the first floor half of the building. And then right next to that side is where we sit uh, in the podcast studio. There's two studios over here. There's Studio A and Studio B. Studio A we're sitting in. And then on the other side of the door over here is Studio B, and Studio B is a, is an equal size space. It's going to become uh, our sound stage. Not a huge sound stage, but you know enough to do stand ups and interviews and you know things like that in there. I mean, you could, yeah, I feel like you could build small sets in there too, for sure. Well, yeah, and even in here, yeah. like this, this is the funny yeah. thing is like when you start talking about podcasts, this is the set that I wanted to sit in. Mm-hmm. I've got my industrial table and if you don't like it, go pound sand. And, you know, <laughs> I built this studio space because I knew we were going to be doing a podcast in here at some point. When we launched the Indie Artist, this just made sense because this is kind of who we are. Not a single one of us is is a normal person. Fine. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're dead right, man. Like, come dead on. Right. I mean, how many guys you know sit I'm around pounding it, metal dude. all day Don't long? Don't call me a normal person. You yeah. know, and and come on. When's the last time you had a real job, Niall? Tell me about it. <laughs> I mean, high school? Yeah. Did you ever work at Subway or some shit? I mean, come on. Were you a burger flipper? No. Well, yeah. No, I was a, I was a sous chef at, at some point. But. See? So, like, we've never had a normal sense of what they consider to be reality we're dreamers and we've always been dreamers and we've always lived with our hearts on our shoulders and you know who's the biggest guy who could tell you about that is him this guy nobody knows this shit about this guy if you look at this clown you'd be like he's a junkie (laughs) you know is he is is this guy on drugs i mean look at him he's like and yet i've never touched a drug in my life (laughs) he has never done a drug people judge him based on his image and and his eyes he's got a, a lazy eye i do Oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> was that your eye or you? Yeah, no. I just thought I was lazy. <laughs> He's just winking at me, man. <laughs> Damn, it's just my eye. Awesome. <laughs> you know, so people judge him based on his appearance. This is the guy that I, I would say has changed the least of all the people that I've ever known in my life. Hmm. Like if you went back to high school and you saw a picture of him in high school, this was what exactly what he looked like in high school. I still wear some of the same clothes. I, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't even fit in mine. <laughs> like those fuck I feel pants. you, brother, man. <laughs> so, you know, there's something to be said for that. You can never judge a book by its cover. And if you judge a book by its cover, you're going to get burned. What do you do for a living? 
I take care of the hand, uh, mentally challenged, mentally physically challenged. How long you been doing that? Thirty two years. Thirty two years. <laughs> and beat that. How many mentally challenged individuals have lived in your home? I got uh, three that currently live with us, and uh, I've had let's see one, two, three others that have lived with us. Yeah. And two that have, two of that have passed away. Actually, no, four. Two, two passed away, and then two have moved on. Wow, man. Yeah. And would you ever say, I'm looking at this guy, and he's this is what he does for a living? There's guys out there that, that you know, we, we've we judged. I mean, I've judged a lot of people in my day, and, and I feel like a shit for doing it. This happens to us all the time. Yeah, like, we, man, we just got fucking judged again when we went to put on your event. Yeah. Right? That's right. And, yeah. and, and what? It's like... Oh, these guys can't, these, who, who are these guys? You know, like what, what can these guys do? I'll, I'll tell you what we could do. We could do a hell of a lot more than you can. You know? <laughs> and I've been beat up for my long hair. You know, it's been a while back, back, you know, but yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they, yeah, it's. I saw it's it. I mean, we did the TV show and they, you know, Tim yeah, Allen yeah, was Tim teasing Allen you about your fucking hair. The whole time, yeah. You know, Tim, yeah. Tim Allen, Richard Karn are like, oh, well, if, if this you doesn't work out, head. we could at least offer him a haircut. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah. Classic. <laughs> Classic. That's why it's yeah. It's even better to to put it to him at the end, you know. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And th and then what? And then so it, it starts this way, and at some point you find a way to earn respect. It takes time. Sometimes it's like like John hasn't gotten the respect he's he's due, and and you know eventually he's going to walk into that, and it's going to happen. And the same thing, even on the show, it happened with you because I mean yeah. you won. Well, and then you know it's, it shifts around too. Like you know, for instance, you know. For me, seeing, you know, John's appearance, I'm going to go, there's a cool dude. I want to go meet that guy. He looks cool. <laughs> right, you right. Know, like, and, and so it's different from your perception. And I think that, like, even in the business world, and, and you know, they're starting to learn, you know, look, we have to start thinking differently on some of these sort of things. And, you know, that's part of what, you know, the discussion needs to be. This stuff needs to be brought up because, you know, this is... Where we are, I mean, uh, how many people are even going to offices anymore, sitting in Cuba? I mean, I guess that's still going on, but boy, that's not the thing it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that used to be such the deal, you know. Uh, it's a different world. And I think, you know, our self-expression, how we look and that sort of thing, you know, it's, uh, you know, when we can kind of control that more, we kind of become a place, you know, that's interesting. People become more interesting, uh it could even create a whole new uh, trend, you know, and, and, you know, something that maybe was a uh, big 30 years ago or something like that all of a sudden comes back, you know, and then you're like, wow, you're spot on, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think like Phoenix too is like, I mean, it was kind of set up, you know, really big in the eighties and it, and it kind of had this real corporate feel for a long time. It's always been a big thing, but um, because so many people are moving here from so many different places, there's a really big culture that's starting to develop here, which I feel like the event you guys put on, right? It's like, why would you get pushed back? Because you're just trying to get artists together and mm -hmm. talk, you know? And I think that's step one, right? It's just like, let's start, let's start working together. That shit just went down on Facebook today, bro. What? Over the event. Oh, nice. And not in a good way either. Like mm -hmm. we, we reached out to organizations. We reached out to a lot of organizations. Let's do this right. right. I met Sean when I produced his segments for Assembly Required on the History Channel. Gotcha. When I meet an individual who's just got the right mindset, I just know it. Yeah. It's a feeling. And, and you know, this was something John taught me a long time ago. I used to, I used to ignore those feelings. Mm -hmm. They're always right. I would look past a lot of that. Oh, well, this guy just needs a chance or this guy just needs this or maybe this guy will come around. Or, there is none of that bullshit. It's like either this is going to be a synergy that you want to work with or it's not. And when you find a synergy like that, it's it's almost like you don't have to try yeah, to do stuff. That's a good way to Right? Point. It's like you don't, you, you don't have to try. I think people are like having that choice now more too where it's like, I mean, you see a lot of that. It's like, Oh, I don't really want to work there or like, I don't want to be in that environment and, and people are choosing, you know, to do their own thing or whatever. Yep. They're just making that conscious choice to like, I don't have to work at a factory for 30 years. You know, it's like, I can choose what I want to do and where I want to work and, and, and the people I want to be around. Right? Yeah. But anyway, continue. What I'm getting at is Sean, Sean was, was selected for the show. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
Tim Allen sent him a bunch of stuff and said, you know, here, you got to build this out of all this shit that we just sent you. And then they threw curveballs. Like, yeah. they, what, they fuck they up your blower? They broke some stuff, and, yeah. yeah. You know, and stuff like that, just to see if you could figure out what's wrong with it. Smash spark plug, things like that. Yeah, yeah. stuff like that, <laughs> just to mess with them. The whole point is, had you not been an artist and had you not had thought outside of the box your entire career, you'd have been sunk. Yeah, yeah, right away. I produced hundreds and hundreds of TV episodes. And across that time frame, I've kind of learned something. You never judge a book by its cover. And I walked into, I don't know what I walked into, Sean. <laughs> I mean, I walked into organized chaos sure. is what I walked into. I walked into, you have to see a shop to understand what I'm talking about. I walked into a space that there's absolutely no way you can make this in. <laughs> Yet it's the only place I can make that. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, and this guy's going up against guys that have these like ridiculous shops and this, you know, these crazy metal machines and all this crazy paint booths and all this other junk. And he, he builds this Mad Max crazy fire throwing leaf blower comes down to the very last second of the build and sends it off to Tim and Richard in L.A., and has no idea if this thing's even going to work. That's right. Yeah. But we had to use those parts. And I knew that one <laughs> valve in it was was very likely faulty, but it still had to go off. To be honest, when they opened it up at the other end, and, you know, I had this thing designed to look like a dragon with this long tail and all this kind of stuff. It didn't work the way I wanted it to. It did, to me, essentially fail. If it had worked correctly, you would have seen it do a fire shoot like you see me do now with my fire shooting handhelds, like the one I call Flaming Lips. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have shot a 25, 30 foot flame, you know, at, at a high temperature. It would have just freaked Tim <laughs> Allen out. <laughs> As it was, you know, Tim Allen's there standing still, with it. It came on. He stole on your it, build. It, it worked. It's still say, where, it's where still is one. this thing? He's like, like for real. He stole. He he, he took it home, and then with <laughs> yeah. this next show, more power that came out. It's he in, it's, it, it's in the intro in every intro, he and so it, it, it shows yeah. Richard Carnes. He has a chainsaw, and, and uh, Tim Allen says, "That's not a tool. This is a tool." <laughs> this is a tool. <laughs> and sticks my thing on the counter, you know, and nobody knows what it is, but it just looks like this giant tool thing that Tim Allen has, you know. But still, I was just like, "Ah, okay, you did like it." Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. There's an ability that people have. We're sitting around this table because, in our own way, we're artists. Oh yeah. And that's the whole vision for the indie artist you don't know where you're going to find an artist you know like i found an artist who does flooring sure so, oh yeah you know and and i found an artist who makes crazy designs on walls out of wood yeah unless you stop and take a look around you don't realize what art really is and to somebody else it's different so to you it could be something you're creating upstairs musically or or in a film mm -hmm. to john it could be something completely different. And to Sean. You know, it's back to that collaboration thing. You don't know what that other person's influence might have on your art. And you bring two artists of different sorts together and all of a sudden this other thing happens. Uh, with a lot of my big pieces, I have to have a team. And so I collaborate with other very amazing artists in their own right. Finding out that like a glass blower does amazing work that goes wonderfully with my metal work. How that could actually function with my things and all become this combination of art. And, you know, to me, growing that is what's creating an uh, uh, environment like I think we're feeling here in Phoenix. As, as soon as you have more and more artists doing that, what we're talking about right there. Now, now this artist has come in and they're bringing in this wood art into the space you created or whatever, all of a sudden mm -hmm. that combination is felt. People talk about it and there becomes this energy around an area where a lot of things are are being combined, you know, and to make a bigger thing. That's Summit Star. You know, that's that's what happens here. And I think that we're feeling that, you know, this is an area that, you know, could really have a lot to talk about, you know, in this kind of, you know, trial and error, just heartfelt efforts. That's what creates, you know, this, if you will, a scene, this, this, what we saw at, at the show, what we see, uh, you know, when we go out. Phoenix needs the sense of like, let's support each other, right? It's not just like, I don't know, I'm using you temporarily so I can go to LA or something. Like, I think they're, we're lacking like Phoenix artists supporting Phoenix artists. Um, mm -hmm. 
having yeah. an identity of of the town, right? You know, you go to New York, you're in a cab, they're going to be playing New York artists on the radio. Like, there's just a support there, yeah. you know? And I feel like because there's so many transplants and stuff, um, and also we just really haven't found our identity, there isn't like a proud of our city, this is our sound, this is our art kind of idea. As soon as we start working together and create kind of this community that needs to happen, I think as soon as we can kind of establish this community, um, people can start really working together because collaboration is really where the magic happens and that's how a city or, or a sound or whatever, a look can can get on the map because it's specific to that community or whatever. Well said, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Guys, this has been a great talk. It seems like we got a lot more to talk about. Yeah, on. It, we sure do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, and we just peel an onion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, we yeah, still got to hear about upstairs. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, let everybody know where we can get in contact with us. What what are the best places for like, get in contact with you now? Um, you can find me through uh, Summer Stars uh, website, which we can bring up or whatever. Um, SummerStarsStudios.com. I'm on there. I'm also popshockproductions.com. Cool. And how about you, Sean? Where can people get a hold of you? Uh, Artofshantyfrench.com or at Shantyfrench on all the social media things. Um, got a lot of stuff out there. Cool. How about you, Michael? I'm around, man. <laughs> if you're if you're not in Facebook jail, <laughs> not, don't don't try to hit me up on Facebook, man. It's uh, I live in Facebook jail. Matter of fact, I love Facebook jail. It's my favorite place to be. I'm on Instagram, and uh, I think I'm Director Michael G. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I think so. I, I'm think terrible that, yeah. with social media, and that's a whole other topic that we had. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah, we yeah. should we should dive into that like oh, yeah, on the next do. episode is how much we suck. At social media. The studio has a website, summitstarstudios.com. We also have summitstarfilms.com, nightfireproductions.com, which is spelled a little bit strange, N-I-T-E-F-I-R-E. That's our genre-based production company. Uh, I have a personal website at magicbuilders.com, which used to be uh, a different kind of website. (laughs) (laughs) But it's been around forever. It's been around for a hot minute. Yeah. Um, and if you if you bounce there, you could find all my social media stuff that probably would make you hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yep, and I'm John Voigt, and uh, you can catch me on Facebook, Instagram. Just look up John Voigt and uh, come to the Summit Star Studios website and Summit Star Films website and all that stuff to, to get a hold of us. Yep, you could go to uh, at Summit Star Studios, I believe it is, on YouTube. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Uh, we have a YouTube channel we just launched. There's a couple of videos of Sean on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a film that we did in a short film that we did in 2015, mm. 14. True Love. Uh, True Love, which um, has basically screened all over the world and uh, is on Amazon Prime and a bunch of other spots. The Facebook page for the indie artist, we should probably have that up here somewhere, but... Uh, I don't know what it's actually called. Just search for the indie artist and look for this logo. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah. like I said, we suck at social media. So. <laughs> yeah. oh, we're just getting we're just getting started. We're just getting started. <laughs> Come on, yeah. you 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 can teach an old dog some tricks. Yeah, exactly. It's just not social media. So yeah. we're we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah, and I definitely have to post more. I don't post hardly ever. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you're not in Facebook jail either. No, that's true. I try to stay out of jail. I try. I try to stay out of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, huh. man. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. 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 Yep. All right. Thank you. And, and uh, yeah, thanks, guys. join us next week All or right. whenever we decide to make another podcast. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> yeah. Subscribe yeah. for more. Subscribe Cheers, guys. For yes, more. yes. Yeah. See you next time. See you.